Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. Think it, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terra in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I'm your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everybody, and thank you once again from the bottom of our hearts for joining us here today for what is going to be another spectacular podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan, and as many of you already know, I'm the author of a series of books entitled Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, all of which are available at Amazon in paperback, ebook, and Kindle format. So please take advantage of that. And in so doing, you will be helping us greatly with our podcast. I also have a number of the books, two through six to be more precise, available at Audible, iTunes, and Amazon for all of you audiophiles out there. So there's a little bit of everything for everyone. And without any further delay... May I bring in my brother and co-host, Kevin Sheehan. Kevin, how are you today? Uh, I'm doing great. How about you, Bill? Super duper. We keep avoiding the snow, and that's okay with me. All right. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Kev, before we get going here today, uh, I am just blown away continually as the weeks and months go on by the listener mail that's coming in. And, uh, of course, you know, I send everything to you that comes in. We both uh, see it and read it. And uh, uh, I'm talking to some of these people on the phone. And uh, it's just incredible, the outpouring (laughs) from all over creation that's coming in. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. I mean, not just the support, which is amazing. You know, just all of the positive you know, and lengthy uh, letters we get, and then also the uh, stories that are coming in are yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I just got off the phone with a fellow named Kelly uh, out in, uh, I'm sorry, Kelly, if I screwed this up. I believe Kelly's in Utah, and uh, I've spoken to him a couple of times, and uh, nice young guy. Uh, he's had... Uh, a sighting and his father had an experience that he can't quite explain. Uh, The father apparently uh, shirking everything off as being a bear. And, uh, you know, Kelly is emphatic uh, that what he encountered was a Bigfoot. Uh, And of course his father told him it was a bear. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) I said, Kelly, yeah. So, I guess your dad doesn't think you know the difference between a bear and a Bigfoot either. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's amazing to hear from these people, uh, to talk to them. Uh, It's just incredible. And there are people out there seeing and encountering something uh, for which they have no explanation, but they know what they're seeing. They know the dimensions of it. They know the smell, they know the howl, they know everything, including that they have, in fact, seen Bigfoot. So what do you say? What do you say to an individual like that? Yeah, I don't know, Bill. It's uh, We certainly hear a lot of stories like that where folks just doubt what their, even what their relatives are telling them they saw. Yeah, so. yeah, uh, you know. You know, and it falls back to the fact that, you know, you can witness an accident. You may misdescribe the color of the vehicle or the fact that it was, uh, according to you, a Mazda and it wasn't a Mazda, it was a Honda. But 
you know you saw an accident, right? Exactly. One car crossed over the double yellow, went head on with the other car. That much you are certain of. Pretty black and white. Exactly. And so I don't understand the, uh, the, the argument of not being able to comprehend at the very least what it is you saw dimensionally. I'm talking height and width, growl, size, run, you know, cannot somebody be trusted to at least accurately describe that much of what they've seen? Yeah, well, it's crazy. It is. And you said it yourself, Kev, having gone to Alaska. You said in one of the podcasts, there's no way I'm going to mistake a, <laughs> a, a bear for a Bigfoot. A bear yeah. for a Bigfoot. It's just no way. <laughs> It's, it's just, it's, it, it well, you mind. know, it's it's kind of funny, but you you know, you grow up as a little kid reading stories about whether it's Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, looking at pictures of bears. I mean, they're a cool animal, right, to check out. But I mean, before you can talk, you know what a bear looks like, and then all of a sudden, you know, people are saying you're mistaken when you see something in the daylight. And someone says, no, it wasn't some other creature, whatever other creature it was. They're telling you it was a bear. Like, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sure it wasn't a pig? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe a squirrel. Yeah, maybe it was an oversized squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty cool. <laughs> that would be some cryptid, huh? That's a good cryptid. I got to look for that at cryptids yeah, in the news. The great and other oddities. Squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> the giant squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's too much. Well, brother, I'm sure you've got something interesting up your sleeve today. Uh, I doubt it's a great horned squirrel. I'll tell you what, it's not a great horned squir squirrel, but it could be one of the freaky deakiest uh, cryptids in the news and other oddities segment. All right. Lay it on us, brother. All right. Today we're uh, going back in time again, and we're going to talk about gargantuan gliders. Gargantuan gliders? Yes. <laughs> so you haven't heard of these. <laughs> these aren't big airplanes, right? They are. Well, not big airplanes, no, but <laughs> big something. So I, I came across this story, and... Um, it's fascinating on a lot of fronts, and it's also kind of a a good jumping off point into uh, UFO investigations. So we'll we'll jump right into it, and you'll see as we get going along here. Okay. So the story, or the, at least the occurrence uh, that we report on here, goes all the way back to 1925, almost a hundred years ago. Wow. Yeah. But it wasn't actually reported to the media until many years later in 1959. Huh. And in 1959, it was reported in Flying Saucers magazine. <laughs> uh, good old Flying Saucers magazine. <laughs> and I hadn't seen Flying Saucers magazine before, but it looks pretty cool. I'm going to put it up on our website, uh, the cover shot of it. But on the cover... Uh, one of the headlines is uh, Mars, Moons, Artificial, and Superman. Does he really exist? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> of course he exists. What are you, stupid? Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so this um, this story, the, the additional details about it were published on uh, February 1st, 2015, by a gentleman by the name of Rob Morphy. And it's on uh, uh, Cryptopia, so one of the websites on uh, cryptids. Pretty, pretty okay. cool. So he yeah. he he uh, pulls out some of the details of the article, and I'll touch on some of them here. So the the original sighting took place near Battle Mountain, Nevada, and Battle Mountain is on Interstate 80 between Salt Lake City and Reno, Nevada in the northern part of the state, so the northern part of the state of Nevada. And to give you a feel, it looks like it's about a six-and-a-half-hour car drive north of Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay. So kind of... Do we know Do we know at all why it was called Battle Mountain? No, I don't know why it was called Battle Mountain. But okay. But called that for a long time. 
So, yep. So, you know, back in 1925, a lot of folks were, uh, you know, after World War One, they were flying around, you know, in sport flyers. So it got pretty popular to either become a pilot or if you were a pilot and you were fortunate enough to survive World War One, you were buying some of these surplus airplanes and flying them around, which which is what our dad did, you know, back in that day as well. Right, Bill? So, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, he had a lot of I remember him telling me stories, Kev, of uh, uh, working on guys uh, airplanes in some of these grass airfields in the city at the time, which are non-existent. Now. Exactly. In New York City. Grass. In New York City, a grass airfield. Exactly. And then uh, he would, uh, in exchange, get flight time with some of these guys in their planes. And he told me stories of uh, flying in open cockpit biplanes. Under the Throg's Neck Bridge in the city in the oh, winter time. That had to be wild. I mean, just like nuts. And by the way, before we continue, where exactly is Superman supposed to change with no phone booths around <laughs> anymore? <laughs> Think about that one. All right. So, so the gentleman that rode into uh, Flying Saucers, he was flying with uh, a couple of his friends, and they had two uh Curtis Jenny airplanes. And I don't know if you remember the Jenny, Bill, but Dad used to have some models of them. And, uh, you know, it was like one of the trainers of World War One. But it's a big biplane. Uh, a lot of them were painted green, as I remember, when, you, when you'd see the models of them. But it's a Curtis Jenny or JN4. And uh, these four guys were out flying together, two, two in each Jenny, so two Jennies flying. And they landed on uh, on top of this mesa in Battle Mountain. And the, the story, uh, the quotation from the gentleman that landed goes as follows. He writes, I must write you of what happened to me in 1925, which I think solves most UFO reports. I've never told this to anyone, but can get a signed affidavit if needed. Four of us were flying old Jennies, um, an early airplane built by Curtis Airplane and Curtis Motor Company over the Nevada desert. We landed on Flat Mesa near Battle Mountain, Nevada. The mesa is about 5,000 square feet, and the walls are too steep to climb unless a lot of work is done. Hmm. We wanted to see what was on top of the flat place. We landed at 1 p.m. While walking about the top of this place, we noticed something coming in for a landing. It was about eight feet across and was round and flat like a saucer. The undersides were a reddish color. It skidded to a stop about 30 feet away from us. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, I mean, what a freaky... You know, and these guys are in these old uh, two-seater uh, open cockpit jennies landing on this mesa, and all of a sudden this thing comes flying exactly. into Exactly, comes, comes hovering in and lands. And the author of this modern-day article, Rob Morphy, he, he writes that it's worth mentioning that, you know, this incident allegedly occurred in 1925, which was a full 22 years before a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Arnold reported in June 24 of 1947 UFO sightings over Mount Rainier. And it Yeah, no. Oh, go ahead. Go. No, no uh, Kenneth Arnold uh was a very experienced pilot and he was flying by Mount Rainier and he was the guy who saw a number of discs uh skipping along as he said, like saucers. Right, exactly. So so Kenneth Arnold was the first one, as you're saying here, to mention or describe these UFOs as, quote, unquote, flying saucers. Yep. So, you know, this, this idea didn't occur, you know, it didn't, didn't exist back in 1925, right? Now, Kev, Kev, most pilots that I've known, and I don't care if they're, private pilots, uh, uh, commercial pilots, uh, pilots from the wartime. Most pilots that I've met are fairly sharp individuals. 
Absolutely, Did, yeah. It, at it, least older pilots. Otherwise, they don't make it to be older pilots. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, he wasn't too sharp. Blank. <laughs> <laughs> but the point I'm getting at is when a pilot gives you a description of something or tells you of something, uh, to me, it, this is a reputable individual. I'm sorry, you know. They're not given to strong drink and uh, foolishness. You know, most of these guys are pretty sharp around an airplane and in the sky and their powers of observation. Yeah, no, no doubt about it, Bill. I mean, it's and, and not only that, you know, I mean, this is not a, a, a statistical <laughs> survey or anything. But, you know, generally, I think the pilots I know, they are definitely the more observant ones. And maybe that's what draws them into something that takes so much skill and really requires you to put your life on the line every time, you know, you take control of the flying yoke, you know? Yeah, so. I guess it's just a, a fight against yourself, kind of, Yeah, right? in a sense, in a sense. Interesting. So this gets really cool here. So, uh, again, um, he writes now, the, the gentleman that witnessed the flying saucer, he says, this next you won't believe. And I don't care, but it's the truth. We walked up to the thing, and it was some animal like we never saw before. It was hurt, and as it breathed, the top would rise and fall, making a half-foot hole all the way around it like a clam opening and closing. Wow. Can you believe that? Yeah, I mean, really bizarre, an animal, a creature of some kind. And that's what I thought was really interesting about this account, right? So he goes on to to write, quite a hunk had been chewed out of one side of the rim and a sort of metal-looking froth issued. When it saw us, right, she, he talks about it again like it's a creature. He says, when it saw us, it breathed frantically and rose up only a few inches, only to fall back to earth again. It was moist and glistened on top. We could see no eyes or legs. Wow. Pretty wild, right? Yeah, and yet he said it saw us. Uh, maybe well, it, he it reacted, right? So when they walked up to it, it, like it started breathing more and, you know, started moving and tried to rise off of the ground. Almost right, as right. if it was afraid. You know, he didn't say that, but those are my words. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and then he says, after about 20 minutes rest, it started pulsating once more. We stayed about 10 feet away. And so, help me, this thing grew as bright as all get out, except where it was hurt. It had a mica-like shell body. It tried to rise up again, but sank back down again. Wow. Yeah. So get this. He says, then we saw a large round shadow fall on us. We looked up and ran. Coming in was a much larger animal, 30 feet across. It paid no attention to us, but settled itself over the small one. Four sucker-like tongues settled on the little one, and the big one got so dazzling bright you couldn't look at it. Both rose straight up and were out of sight in a second. They must have been traveling a thousand miles an hour to get so high so fast. Unbelievable. Is it crazy? Yeah, and I mean, he's he's not calling anything... Uh... He's not describing, in his mind anyway, a machine. No, he, he, all the way along in this account, that's what I thought was so fascinating. He describes it as a living thing, an animal, and another animal. You know, so it's kind of, uh, like, this is the first time I've ever seen anything like this, where it was described as living. And maybe it's not the first time, but it's the first time I've seen it. And um, I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought that was super cool. Yeah, who coined the phrase the gargantuan gliders? Um, I think it was in the article, in the original Flying Saucers article. Yeah, maybe whoever did the interview just came up with that name. Yeah, yeah. 
So then he says, we walked over. So this is after the larger one picked up the small one and flew away at a thousand miles an hour. He says, we walked over there and there was an awful stench. And the frothy stuff, the little one had bled, looked like fine aluminum wire. There was more frothy, wiry stuff in a 30-foot circle where the big one had breathed. This Jeez. stuff finally melted in the sun, and we took off. Holy cow. <laughs> now, Kev, you know, what's the top speed of a Jenny? Maybe 80 miles an yeah, hour? I was going to say 80, 80 miles an hour would be fast. Yeah, uh, with a good wind. Right. Uh, and these guys are describing something at a thousand miles an hour, which to them was a rocket. Exactly. You know, uh, you know, a thousand miles an hour. And this thing, uh, first of all, the one on the ground seemed I, organic in some way from the description. No doubt. And then this other thing with suckers descending from it and grabbing the smaller one to take it with it. Right. That's really. Uh, very, very bizarre encounter. Absolutely. So then wow. Rob Morphy, again, the author of this modern article, he reports that years later, um, uh, Wood, who's the gentleman that saw this stuff, he'd come to regret not having any evidence of these animals, right? He's talking about it, but he doesn't have any evidence of it. And, uh, but he was, he was also aware of the fact that he had to preserve his reputation as a reliable pilot, that he also had to distance himself from this report. So, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting, right? Where we, we, I think in our first podcast together, Bill, you asked me, who I would tell if I saw a Bigfoot, you know, because it's that interesting question. If you see something really weird and is believed not to exist, like this gargantuan glider, and and if you have a reputable job, like this guy being an early pilot, he doesn't want to tell anybody about it. Yeah. So later on in life, though, he wrote this story. He wrote another letter to uh, Ray Palmer, who was the guy that wrote in Flying Saucer magazine. So he writes here, and I quote, So help me, this was an animal. I have never told this before, as we knew no one would believe us. I only write now because this animal would be one big 30-foot light if seen by night. I don't expect belief, but I simply had to write. Don't use my name. I'm still flying. But right, if you want more information. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah, it is awesome. And, you know, uh, the thought comes to mind that somebody initially seeing anything uh, extraordinary might, out of sheer excitement, uh, just have to get it off their chest. And then perhaps later on uh, thinks differently about it and says, you know what, maybe I better shut up. <laughs> You know, really. I mean, well, but he waited I, I mean, a long time, right, to say anything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here the guy's a pilot, you know, and again, he doesn't want anybody to think he's lost his ability to think uh, straight and uh, take his ability to fly away from him, right. you know? Yeah, lose his job, right? It's his livelihood. Sure. Yeah, it's a trade-off, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, and, and as you said, years later, uh, that sighting occurred... Uh, over uh, Rainier about the skipping discs. Yeah. And he later on was the one who estimated their speed based on how much distance they uh, had traveled, I believe, between the uh, adjoining peaks in the mountain range. Ah, okay. Yeah, and I think Arnold came up with some figures like 1,000 miles an hour or 1,500 miles an hour hmm. uh, to cover the ground they had. And, uh, yeah, that was the original flying saucer tail, the skipping like saucers. Mm. Wow. Really incredible. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome yeah. stuff. So I, t I promised you freaky deaky. Well, you surpassed freaky deaky. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll put, uh, I'll put some of this stuff, uh, you know, there's a couple of images in here, not of, uh, kind of like artist rendering of these critters and stuff like that. I'll put that up on our website as well. All right. Well, in the spirit of freaky deaky, <laughs> my dear listeners, little did you know 
that when you tuned into this podcast today, you were about to enter a realm beyond space and time. You are now entering the Bigfoot Zone. (laughs) Oh, yes. We haven't been in the Bigfoot Zone in a while, Kev. But today, we're stepping into it yet again. Now, you know, I like to say things somewhat tongue-in-cheek and have a little fun at the same time. But before I read this tale on the request of uh, one of our, was it one of our listeners, Kev, or somebody commenting on one of the paperback books on Amazon? Oh, which one are you doing? You didn't tell me. Well, I'm going to be taking the listeners into this story that uh, revolves around uh, Deadfall oh, Lake. Dead Falls Lake. So this actually came in on a review of the podcast on oh. uh, the Apple Podcast Player. So thank you. It was a five-star review. We love those. So everybody, please leave us a five-star review. And this person took the time to write a little bit in the review and said, uh, and by the way, please tell us more about the Dead Falls encounter. All right. So here we go, folks. Batten down the hatches and uh, lock the doors. <laughs> Uh, And I'll tell you right now, coming into this tale, I'm going to warn you up front that this may be the freakiest sighting that I have ever heard. And I'll ask you to follow along as a brother and sister, Marion and Chris Lane, weave this amazing story. Mm -hmm. And apparently, Bill, I don't know if you can hear it. You got Dog Man riled up outside by saying that. (laughs) All right. Well. In July of 1984, a group of about 20 people and the two of us had planned to head into the Shasta National Forest and hike up to Dead Falls Lake for a little overnighter with guitars and beers. If you've never been there, Mount Eddy Lake and Dead Falls Lake sit in what I would call a bowl surrounded by mountain peaks. There isn't much of a shoreline to speak of. Instead, the surrounding hills and trees abruptly meet the edge of the water. It's a fantastic and desolate spot and a great destination for those who want to hike in and crash on a blanket once you can't stay awake any longer. We began the night's festivities and it was turning out to be a pretty good night. We had some campfire sing-alongs, hot dogs, and quite a lot of beer. We first noticed the blue light at about 2 a.m. The light was emanating from thousands of feet up, glowing over one of the northern peaks. Considering that there isn't anything out here in this hour of the night, aside from people like us, it was a bizarre sight. Needless to say, it had all of our attention. Some of us sat and others stood as we watched the blue light grow in intensity. It seemed as though the unknown source of light was about to come over the peak. About 10 minutes later, there it was. It was miles away, but we could now make out a large glowing disk exuding what appeared to be a combination of extremely bright blue and white light. From a distance, it almost appeared like the disk was alive. I know this is really weird, but you will know shortly why I mention it. If it hadn't had our attention before, it certainly had our attention now. It slowly made its way over the peak and was gradually making its way down into the valley in which we were gathered. As it began the descent, beams of light started to emanate from different sides of the object. They moved from one side to the other, flashing on and off as it appeared to be scouring the terrain. Some members of the group were already getting antsy and afraid, especially the girls. But there was nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. 
especially since the searchlights were so bright. It was getting closer and closer to our position. We realized that whatever it was could certainly see our blazing fire. So some of us started to throw dirt on the flames and squirting on them with beer. Others filled empty bottles with water from the lake in order to extinguish it. It was difficult for us to gauge the distance and size of this object, but it was slowly coming towards the lake and the entire landscape was glowing beneath it. All of us could now see that the craft was organic. Now it was glowing with a yellowish-white color, but bright blue still swirled around its base, which appeared to our eyes like pigment being mixed into a can of fresh paint. It was beyond my wildest imagination. Another ten minutes passed when half of the group said that they were getting the heck out of here, and the rest of us stayed. In the movies, the people who run always get attacked, and I wasn't planning on being one of them. This craft had now reached the other end of the lake, which was still a considerable distance away from us. By this time, I could now see that this disc was at least 200 feet across, when all of a sudden it stopped and began to pulse growing brighter and then dimmer, like a heartbeat. All of the searchlights had stopped moving, and a ring of fuzzy, multicolored lights started to circle its outer edge. They were red, green, and yellow, and weren't sharp like the searchlights. Our fire was completely out now, and we were standing in the pitch dark, totally awed by what we were seeing as this thing hovered over this one spot for almost 20 minutes. Suddenly, a wide column of powder blue light flashed from its base to the ground below as the craft continued to pulse. From our vantage point, it was little more than a speck, but there was something being drawn up from the ground within the tube of light. This thing stopped about midway between the ground and the craft, literally suspended in midair within this tube of light. Everything we were looking at stayed still for another 10 or 15 minutes. But then several other specks started to descend from the craft's base within the tube. These specks were much smaller than the first, Again, from the distance we were, there was no way of telling what any of these things were. The descending specks stopped in the middle of the tube, right where the first object was. After another half an hour of stillness, the specks that had descended were drawn back upward and vanished from our sight. However, the other one remained suspended in the middle of this tube of light. Suddenly, the craft stopped pulsing and began to glow brightly again, illuminating the entire lake area and the countryside below. And then it started to move. It glided slowly and silently over the lake, heading directly towards us. Not a word was spoken among those who remained. We were awestruck and silent, staring in utter amazement. It was now only a football field away and coming closer, and I could see that this was a glowing structure. It was definitely a large disc, but it had to be 400 feet wide, not the 200 feet I originally had thought. It was enormous. The shaft of blue light remained totally intact and unmoving as the ship itself moved over the lake. The water started to grow choppy, just like it would appear on a windy day. However, it was only choppy within the confines of where the light contacted the lake's surface. 
everything around the perimeter was still calm. The light was drawing on and or disturbing the water as it passed over it. Now, I could see beyond the shadow of a doubt that the speck that had been lifted up from the earth and into the tube was in fact a gigantic Bigfoot. It looked like it was in a state of suspended animation, being held in the light tube some 75 feet off the lake surface. It didn't move an inch and was completely aglow in the soft blue light. The saucer passed just to our east, and we all turned like automatons, watching it move away. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light, and it was all over. The disk was totally and completely gone. It had not flown away at a high rate of speed. It had vanished. We all stood in a daze for a few moments, almost as if we had been taken over by some type of mystic force while these events had unfolded. Seeing the Bigfoot motionless within the tube of light was unbelievable, to say the least. And what the connection was between it and the craft is still unknown to all of us. We simply saw what we saw. To stand in the open country and watch this silent, massive, glowing disc move across the landscape was intimidating. I mean, we all know jets, prop planes, ultralights, and rockets. But to behold something 400 feet in diameter moving at a snail's pace and hovering motionless, while not so much as making a sound, was mind-blowing. It had to run on some sort of inexhaustible energy source. The lights were so bright, and they never stopped pulsing or glowing. I mean, think about it, he says. When we fly on a jetliner, there are the cabin lights and a few lights on the fuselage of the jet. This entire craft was a light, and it contained numerous other tremendously powerful lights within it as well. The entire skin of this thing was moving, or at least that's the way it appeared to our eyes. It was like liquid contained within some, within some type of casing, moving plasma, shifting and melting and swirling together. What do you make of that, folks? Holy cow. Well, you promised Freaky Deaky. You delivered. <laughs> I mean, you know, and although this story to many sounds over the top, if I've said it before, I'll say it again. I believe that there is a connection between UFOs and Bigfoot regarding many of the encounters. Not all of them, but many of them. And this kind of all tumbles back on my own personal belief that there are two things at work here. Uh, the demonic, as I always say, and the real McCoy, Bigfoot, Sasquatch creature. Hmm. But then, what Bill, you are you saying that you don't believe in UFOs or you believe that they're demonic or is that another yeah. thing? Yeah, no, I believe that uh, the UFO uh, phenomena is of demonic origin. 100%. Yep, I have right. no doubt about right. it. So, you know, now that opens up another can of worms, and I am of the mindset that I don't need all the answers in my life. And because I don't know or understand something doesn't mean that it's not true. In other words, I could see something and really have no explanation for it at the time, but it doesn't mean I didn't see it. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's just say uh, uh, 200 years ago, I saw a shooting star, and nobody around the area knew what a shooting star was. I mean, I saw it. I don't have an explanation for it. I could call it a, a demon, a monster, uh, and anything I want, but I know I saw it. And I don't have an explanation for the UFO phenomena. 
uh, how objects could be created, uh, how all of these things could come to be. But I just have an inner unction that tells me uh, that this is coming from a realm that you really don't want anything to do with. Mm. All right. Well, yep. I don't want to uh, go against uh, the demonic realm <laughs> <laughs> in that I definitely, you know, uh, know that there's uh, or believe that there's demonic things out there in a demonic realm. But I'm not sure I agree that all UFOs are demonic, but it's good. I totally respect it. But uh, yeah, we, this we is certainly no totally weird, you know. Yeah. And then going a little bit further, though, you're saying that. This is like uh, the Dominic realm um, um, kind of uh, pretending to be a Bigfoot or, or you know, uh, um, creating its formation as a Bigfoot at that particular point in time. Well, I think what they're doing is they're uh, using the Bigfoot uh, as a format for somewhat of like, as this guy used the word automaton mm -hmm. or robot or whatever word you want to attach yeah, to Yeah, so it. they're in a very rural place and here in the Pacific Northwest and they materialize as uh, a Bigfoot to kind of disguise what what they really are. Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, well, yeah. there uh, there are many people out there who believe in the UFO phenomena, uh, creating other types of creatures. Sure, sure. Uh, we've heard all of these crazy descriptions, everything from the greys to blonde head humans. Oh yeah, uh, the the uh, men in black, all of these strange phenomena, uh, guys that have plaster looking faces, uh, uh, no no humor about them. Uh, wearing sunglasses at night, you know, extending their hands and they don't look real. They're like mannequin like. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like real. Talk about freaky deaky. This is really <laughs> out of the envelope stuff here we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I of course, uh, have heard about them, uh, you know, the, the theory of these aliens uh, um, uh, taking the form of other things and maybe trying to mimic the form of humans, but falling a little bit short. You know, yeah, well, in look, several different uh, ways. look at this story of, around Dead Falls Lake. If you believe what this brother and sister shared, which there were 20 other witnesses to, it seems to me that this ship or thing, whatever it is, was it looked like it was scouring the landscape. And when it found what it was looking for, it retrieved it. And it almost sounds like something or things came down out of this craft and were manipulating or doing something uh, which he described as specks to descending to the original speck that had lifted up. It was almost like they were doing something with it before they retreated back into this ship and then the the what he described as a Bigfoot creature was still left in this tube of light as it moved across the lake. Now, look, what that's all about, I have no freaking idea. <laughs> I mean, and that's that's where I stand with that. Sure, I'm I'm just sharing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you could you could take it or leave it, uh, you know. Uh, but we just throwing it out there, folks. Definitely freaky deaky. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah, so that's uh, it's it's bizarre stuff, and uh, you know it's funny too, Kev, because uh, you had no knowledge of what was going to be inside of this uh, when I read it today. But I was thinking about it as I was reading it when you were talking about those gargantuan gliders. You remember the guy said that the thing he kept calling it an animal, right? But he said it had a mica finish on it. Yep. And and folks, if you don't know what mica is, it's kind of like a uh, 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 like a mirror. It's like a, a rock that is uh, could be a piece of a mirror. Right, and it's flaky. Yeah, very. When you thin. see it in nature. It's, it's in layers. Thin. It's in layers. Right. Yeah. It's brittle. It's flaky, yeah. uh, and it has a shine to it. Uh, 
And this craft that he was describing, he said it looked organic, uh, like it was a, a pigment swirling around in a casing, he described Yeah, it that as. was a cool description, by the way. That was, that was... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a very, you know, uh, I don't know what to say about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I just share it. It's it's mind blowing, and he said it blew his mind. Now it's blowing all of our minds. No doubt about it. It's got me thinking. So, uh, yeah. So there you have it. Very cool. So so we go from nineteen twenty four or five and uh, Jenny's uh, Jenny biplanes to four hundred foot discs with beams of light moving silently over a lake. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Only on Bigfoot Terror in the Woods. <laughs> yeah. We bad. We bad. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> so what do we got, brother, in our listener mail uh, category? Today? Yeah, we got some good listener mail again, like you were saying at the start. Um, so the first letter comes in from Grace in North Dakota. All right. And Grace says, first, I love your podcast and how the two of you interact during the show. It's the perfect mix of all things cryptid. So kudos to both of you. Yeah, Grace. <laughs> Obviously, neither of you are any man's fool and can appreciate that. And I can appreciate that. Bill, you spoke of watching the series Expedition Bigfoot, which I as well have seen. What's your overall take on it now that it is complete? Wow. Well, uh, Grace, my take on that show was, I think it was just an incredible uh, event. I'm glad they did it. Uh, I think these individuals were totally credible. Uh, Outside of the fact that it was done for television, uh, there might have been a few uh, ev- events there that were dramatized for the sake of TV, but I think what they put out there, their technique, uh, their determination, uh, and the individuals who were involved uh, in the expedition itself, I believe their hearts were in it. Uh, it's not a sham. Uh, I believe what they were collecting and looking for is legitimate. Uh, I really think they're on to something over there, as I do many, uh, as I do think of many people uh, uh, around the country who are sincere about looking for this creature. And uh, if you caught the end of the show, uh, they had hung that one uh, solar activated camera high up on that cliff overlooking this valley uh, and a hillside. Uh, and in the end, in the last show, Kev, they showed a tall, dark creature walking across between uh, two patches of trees. Very cool. I didn't get to the uh, last episode yet, so I'm uh, now I'm more eager than ever to see it. Yeah, and and I'm not taking anything from it. You're going to see it, and you're going to make your own sure. surmisal sure. about what you're seeing. But so you're saying are, that you're saying it might have been a bear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, a, a giant fanged squirrel. <laughs> That's what it was, Kevin. I saw it. <laughs> Don't make fun of me. <laughs> Woohoo. <laughs> this creature, whatever it was, I don't know many hunters that walk around dressed in black from boots to head. Uh, anywhere. I'm familiar with camouflage hunting, but I don't know people who wear black gloves, black boots, black pants, black jacket, black hood, uh, walking around hunting or hiking. So whatever this thing was, was definitely dark, and it looked really big to me in the picture. Uh, They had other things going on there, uh, whistling, uh, some knocking noises, uh, the stench at certain points. They found a nest. Uh, remember, Kev, we were talking yep. about this, the yep. nest at Marble Mountain? Absolutely. And they uncovered a nest uh, that was basically the same as the one is at Marble Mountain. 
uh, huge, huge limbs snapped off. I'm talking some of the limbs in the pictures there looked to be like eight or ten inches wide, and they were broken off fresh. Super cool. I mean, what what could snap off uh, without the aid of a mechanical device or, or some type of hydraulics? What can snap off a 10-inch diameter fresh limb from a tree? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so. All right, we're going to go over to Scandinavia next with Paul in Norway. Some of our distant relatives there, Bill. <laughs> yeah. He says, I really find your diatribe to be quite entertaining. I'm not sure mm. that's good, but quite entertaining. Yes. Okay. And yes. he says, I've always doubted the validity of such things, but I must say that the more I listen, you are swaying my opinion. Ah. <laughs> Great show. And he writes, P.S. I've purchased two of your audiobooks. All right. All right, Paul. Bravo, bravo. Not only writing, but buying, too. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, he gets it. And, folks, you know what? I say it all the time. Uh, what I do does not happen uh, by uh, <laughs> coincidence. There's a lot of uh, cost and effort here. So if you want to help out, we don't charge anything. Go out and buy a book and uh, give it to somebody or read it, and uh, you'll be helping us along quite a bit. Uh, that is an excellent little piece of mail there, you know, and the fact that this guy is listening in and his thoughts are now being swayed that there's a possibility that this thing is real. Mm. Very interesting, you know. So I got a, I got a good one here that also talks a bit of an account, uh, an encounter. Um, I'm not going to say the name because even the first name is quite unique and he gives some okay. of the locations. But he writes in that my encounter was in mid-1985 and was conveniently filed out of my memory as I told it once and was made a fool. And apparently I was probably and I was told I was probably suffering from fatigue. However, Great. I had scratch marks on the side and in the box of my rental truck. It happened directly between Fort Nelson, British Columbia, and uh, Zama, Alberta, if that's how you pronounce it, while I was driving a winter road. It's only because of your comments and understanding that I am opening this chapter again. Pretty cool. cool. And he says, if you're interested in talking... I think I'm up for it. I've always worked in the Canadian oil and gas sector. I just think this show is so well balanced. You're, you're two of the best in the field for representing the field of cryptids. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, my friend, I know who you are. And if you're listening, I am going to be in touch with you. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I got to get to the bottom of the scratches on the inside and outside of the box truck. Maybe Bigfoot was taking a little ride. Uh, or investigating uh, the cargo. Maybe. Uh, whatever, you know. But uh, the poor guy, again, he, he opens his mouth and uh, he's made a fool. And, uh, you know, I'm glad he's coming out and talking about it. No doubt. Uh, and I... I definitely intend to uh, give this fellow a jingle. I have his phone number and uh, see if we can't get to the bottom of the rest of the story. As Paul Very Harvey cool. I mean, he's say. right in the hotbed up there in British Columbia, too. So, Yeah, there's good, no doubt good about stuff. it. Oh. You know, and listen, guys, if you're out there, if you're in the oil and gas business up there, you're out there running lines and, and working in the wilderness out there. Uh, the lumber industry, uh, 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 the game department, if you're a game warden anywhere around the Northeast or Canada, uh, we want to hear from you. If you've seen something, I don't care how minuscule you think it is, uh, how uneventful you think it is, I am telling you and encouraging you to contact me because Kevin and I want to know about it. 
Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Yep. Let us know. All right. We got one more email here, Bill, from Robert in Lansing, Michigan. And Robert writes, best podcast ever. Thanks for doing the work. I just wanted to say that, of course, I love Bigfoot, but I really enjoy your cryptids in the news segment as well. Haven't okay. se- yeah, I don't haven't seen anything as of yet, but you will be the first to know. God bless, Robert. So, Robert, keep an eye out for Dogman up in that part of the woods, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> man, that Dogman is a nasty freaking critter boy. <laughs> I'm telling. Hey, hey, what I would know. you do, Kev? What would you do if you were out for a jog one evening, and something like that jumped out of the woods in front of you? You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, people talk. You know, like they're Superman. Oh you know, well, I'd go up and bust them on the lip. Is what I do. I, you know, I've never fainted in my life, but that might be the first occasion. Might drop you. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Heart attack, wow. whatever. I, I don't know, news. man. Bad news. Well, great, great show tonight. Uh, again, uh, we started out by thanking everyone for their support. We've also been great getting some great five-star reviews. Again, it just takes a minute. Open up your player now and hit five stars. We really appreciate it, and uh, and it brings a lot more listeners to the podcast and makes it easier for us to uh, keep going with some great shows. So thank you awesome. for your support. Yeah, and uh, it stands true for the books and audio books, too, folks. If you purchase one of these books, give it a listen. Uh, give me a good rating on there. You know, lay the stars on me or I'll put some stars on you. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the old cartoons, Kev? Somebody would get in the head, hit in the head, and that ring of stars. The Tweety Birds around. going around. <laughs> 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 All righty, then. And until we meet again, my fine feathered friends, remember, always carry more gun than you think you're going to need. Sleep tight. <laughs>